Good morning, church. It's wonderful to be in the house of God this morning, isn't it? It's a privilege to be in the house of God. Amen? Today, I bring you greetings from the People's Church Assembly of God, Sri Lanka, and from our senior pastor, Reverend Dishan Vikramratna. My husband, General Veera Surya, and I count it a privilege and a pleasure to be in your midst this morning. Thank you for inviting us to share our testimony. I can't tell you everything because God has done so much in our lives, but let me give you a few highlights of what the Lord has done for us. I would like to start with something very important in my life. The day I met my husband, I was a very young teenager and he had, was a young army officer. But you know, it didn't take me long to persuade this young officer to lay down his arms and surrender to mine. We have been together for quite some time, but when we got married, everybody who knew us pronounced that it was a recipe for disaster. Because I was an only child, my parents were both only children, and I was petted and pampered because I was born to my parents after 13 long years of being childless. And so they said that this pampered only child was going to marry a disciplined army officer. In fact, they said I had fallen in love with the uniform. And when when reality walked through the front door, love would fly out of the back door. They even said that our marriage may not last after the honeymoon. But I'm here to report to you that many moons have come and gone and we are still together. The reason we are together is because we invited a third person into our marriage. And I hasten to add that it's a dangerous thing to invite a third person into your marriage unless that third person is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Yes, Jesus is the foundation of our family and the third person in our marriage. And if not for Jesus, we would not have made it. All those predictions would have come true. But it is Jesus who has walked with us in our life's journey, in our marriage, and given us victory over all the situations we had to face as a family. You know, people look at us and they say, he uh, was an army chief, an ambassador, uh, the world president of the Milton Christian Fellowships. What problems do they have? Aha, you should hear the whole of our testimony. I'll just give you a few highlights. We have gone through many trials and tribulations and tragedies and triumphs in life because Jesus walked with us. Amen? When The Lord blessed us with three beautiful children, not all at the same time, of course, one at a time. (laughs) And our eldest was a son and then two daughters. I bore my eldest child when I was barely, well, I was a teenager, barely 20. And uh, he and I grew up together. Like I told you in the morning, when he cut his first tooth, I cut my wisdom tooth and hope for wisdom. (laughs) We, he was my friend, my son, my companion, especially because my husband was often away from home in far off bases. And one day, my, my son, I have to tell you this, he grew to be a six footer. He towered over us. And when I had to uh, tell him something and when he was naughty, he used to just carry me and run around the house. I was such a petite little thing and he was a big boy. And one day in June, my God decided that there was something very special for my son. He was an athlete, he was a sportsman, he was our pride and joy, our only boy. But he came back after a football match and he said, Mom, I'm not feeling too good. And so I asked the doctor to examine him, his heart pressure, pulse reflexes, everything was normal. And the doctor said I was making a fuss about nothing. But in a matter of moments, our son just stopped breathing. And the doctor gave him CPR, got him round, rushed off for the ambulance. And my son asked me, Mom, what's all the fuss about? He didn't know that he had stopped breathing for a little while. And then he said to me these beautiful words, Mommy, pray with me. Not for me, but with me. There's a big difference there. And I said, yes, my son, I'll pray with you. He nestled in my arms, placed his hand, my hand over his heart, looked deep into my eyes as if he was trying to impress my very image on his innermost mind. And then he looked up to heaven and smiled and his face glowed. And then he closed his eyes and I felt his young heart stop beating. 
And in that moment I cried out to God and I said, "My God, you promised never to give me a burden too heavy to carry. How can I live without my boy?" And then the Lord, the still small voice of God said, "Look at your son. He still lays he lays still in my arms, but he's he had this beautiful smile on his face and I realized that no 16-year-old boy could have died in that manner without a backward glance or a moment's hesitation. My son had leapt into his heavenly father's waiting arms, thus teaching me his mother that for a Christian death was but a door into eternal life. Amen. And so, with though my heart was breaking, I learned to love my God all the more. Satan thought he got me there because he thought I will curse God and turn away from him. But it was only in that moment when my son died that I realized what it cost my God to give me his only son to die on that cruel cross so that my son and all of us could have eternal life. I loved my God. I worshiped my God. I thanked my God. I adored my God, and God gave me more more faith, more love because my boy is safe in heaven. It is not easy. It is not easy. Do not think that I do not weep, but I I do weep, but I do not weep as one who doesn't have hope because I have the blessed assurance that we are going to spend eternity in glory. And so 2 years later I was expecting another baby and even before scan was done I knew this baby was going to be a little boy and that I prayed that he would fill the void that our son had left in our lives and I was speaking I was preaching in UK and US but I came back home to Sri Lanka to have the baby in Sri Lanka but once again my husband was sent off to a far off base he was not with me and I went into labor 3 weeks before my due date and our friends in their concern brought a doctor a GP a general practitioner and not a kind gynecologist and he gave me some medication to stop the labor pains and I went into hemorrhaging and they rushed me to hospital and in a matter of hours our baby son was born a beautiful little boy a 9 pound baby boy but i never held my baby in my arms i never saw the color of his eyes i never felt the warmth of my baby in my arms because i saw a group of doctors working on him and they didn't tell me what was wrong it took my husband 10 hours to come down from the far off base to colombo the capital city and he came rushing in to hold his baby son in his arms and then The doctors met him and they said we are sorry your infant son just passed away due to a medical error and your wife is dying. They they told him that I was hemorrhaging so much blood they gave me 16 pints of blood though a body doesn't hold that much because the more more they gave me the more blood I gushed out and then they put me on um, saline plasma oxygen and finally on the heart monitor and they told my husband do your religious rites because she's not going to live through the night. but my husband is a very stubborn man and he did not give up on god and he knelt by my bed and he prayed into my ear i was unconscious for 10 hours but he continued to pray into my ear and there came a point when i regained consciousness for one split second i looked at my husband and i said i beg of you sri lal stop praying for me and i lost consciousness again because i knew it was his prayers that were anchoring me to life and at that time i just wanted to go to heaven and be with my boys and jesus but he didn't give up praying and there came a time when they put him out of the room and the heart mon- it indicated that there was no pulse in my body there was no heartbeat and the doctors pronounced me clinically dead and covered me up with a sheet at this point i have to tell all of you don't be afraid of me i'm not a ghost i'm what the doctors call a 21st century miracle our god is still in the miracle working business amen I see stickers on cars and they say God is dead. And I say I'm very sorry for you, but my God is well and alive. In fact, I spoke to him just this morning. Amen. Our God is alive. And when God is for us, who can be against us? You and I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. Amen. And my God, my God has stood by me. You know when my my godly grandmother i had to break the news we had to break the news to my godly grandmother that i was going to marry an army man and we thought she was going to be upset so with great trepidation we went to my grandmother and we told her i told her granny i i am going to marry a military man and she said uh 
I said, I, I didn't say military. I said, Granny, I'm going to marry a captain in the army. And she was, she just flung her arms around us and blessed us. And she said, I have been praying for this. It seemed too good to be true. We received a blessing. We got married. And a couple of months later, she visited home. And she asked me, darling, where is your young man? And I said, he, he's in the army, in the, in the military, and he's not here. She said, good gracious. I thought he was a captain in the Salvation Army. <laughs> and it was my turn to say whom God has put together let not even well-meaning grandmothers put asunder so yes we have had all these ups and downs but God has been good when God when they came out to tell my husband that there, that there was no breath in my body they pronounced me clinically dead the doctors my husband was in prayer with all my church family they were in the corridors of the church battling of corridors of the hospital battling for my life on their knees and around the world there were telephone calls to all the churches we had ministered in and they were battling around the world on their knees for my life while the doctors did what they could but they are, when the doctors couldn't do any more when my heart stopped when they pronounced me clinically dead when they covered my body with a sheet my God was still there and as my husband and pastors prayed they, the doctors came out to tell him that it was all over for me. They didn't have the heart to tell him. They went back to the room. They were pacing the floor, wondering how to break the news to him. When suddenly, the doctor felt compelled to look at the heart monitor again. And as he watched, it started moving. He rushed to my body, ripped off the sheet, took my pulse, and I was alive again. Today, every breath I take is for God's glory. Wherever I go, I'm a gypsy for the Lord. I serve my God. My husband is now the world president of the military Christian fellowships, as you heard, with 150 member nations. We go around the world testifying, encouraging military men and women to love and serve God with integrity and purity so that their nations and their world will be blessed. And God has given me spiritual children around the world to mentor more than these arms could hold because he gave gave me Isaiah 54 and I paraphrase it, extend the pegs of your tent young barren woman and I will give you more children than you can hold and my God is a promise keeping God, so is yours, amen? Yes, our God never fails on his promises and yes, we have had times when we have been apart from each other a lot um, because of the call of duty and I remember the Lord laying on my husband's heart that he should... Um, he should share Jesus with his officers and soldiers. And since we're only 1% Christian in the army in Sri Lanka, he was wondering how to do it. And the Lord said, just find one man to pray with you in agreement. That's the power of prayer. Two together, one will chase thousand, two, ten thousand. Just find a prayer partner and start praying. And that's what he did. And when that young officer, um, he had no choice poor man when his boss asked him to come he had to go and pray and later his friends asked him what were you doing in the boss's room and he said well we were praying for all of you boss wanted me to pray with him for you and very soon more and more people gathered and to cut a long story short hundreds of them got together there wasn't room in the office they had to meet in the conference hall my husband taught them about the 91st psalm and they had this copies made laminated they used to carry it meditate on it and still it was not enough they asked for the whole bible and my husband said send me bibles and we are in partnership, we are a team wherever we work together for the Lord. And so in the capital city, I appealed to people and they brought me Bibles, 5,000 odd Bibles. Our home became a warehouse. We filled the boxes with Bibles and I asked my prayer partners to pray over the Bibles that God would just blind the eyes of the people and we would be able to send it officially in the, in the ships to the harbor. And they, it did, every ship that carried Bibles went safely to harbor. And the, the, the bases, the camps were just saturated with the world of God. Miracle upon miracle started happening. And there was once a Brigadier General who was visiting the base and he heard these miracles. He borrowed a Bible and read the Bible through the night and learned the 91st Psalm by heart. That the next day he was in his helicopter when the helicopter was shut down, shot down and he sent a radio message to my husband saying sir we are shot down we are crashing and he said that God of the 91st Psalm save us and then there was silence after a while he read your message to my husband again and said, Sir, the God of the 91st Psalm protected us. We are all alive. We landed safely and we were able to praise our God. 
Just a few days later, uh, there was uh, an, uh, an armored tank which went over uh, a landmine and there was a huge explosion and the soldiers came running to pick up the bodies they thought of their colleagues who would be dead. But to their amazement, out of the debris, out of the fire, out of, uh, out of the smoke, walked five men from the tank, completely unscathed, totally alive, praising God and praising the God of the 91st Psalm. What are the dangers you face today? What are the fears you face today? Is your boat rocking as our pastor said? Well, if Jesus is in the boat, you will reach harbor safely. Amen? And so we learn to trust our God. I was um, looking at me, you won't believe this, but there was a time when I was unable to walk. I was an invalid. I was pushed around on a wheelchair and then I was, it, I got worse and I was on in bed an invalid with only, I could only move my 10 fingers and my neck. Again, praise God for my praying husband. He knelt by my bed. He pleaded with God. He said to God, God, she has suffered enough emotionally and mentally and physically. Heal her, Lord. I'm putting out a fleece. Show me what to do. I am desperate. And yes, the very next day, the Lord showed him a way. I was taken to a, uh, for treatment and miraculously, I was taken uh, practically in an ambulance. I came back home walking for the glory of God. Amen. These feet have not stopped walking. This tongue has not stopped wagging for the Lord ever since. I remember when I was a little girl, my grandmother used to tell me, darling, don't talk too much, you know, because you will have to give account for every idle word you speak. And I was a chatterbox. It, I still couldn't stop talking. But if anyone asked me to talk about the... Uh, the Lord, I used to be shy. Would you believe this? And my local pastor, when I was a little girl, said, you know, you have, um, you have training in speech, in drama, in elocution, in English, so I want you to come and read the scriptures in church. But I, I, used to, I used to avoid him like the plague. When he came through the front door, I ran out of the back door. But one day we met, and he said, next Sunday, you come and read the scriptures in church. So I went like a lamb to the slaughter. You know, my knees had fellowship with each other. My tongue cleaved to the roof of my mouth. I looked at the congregation and I remembered my elocution teacher said I must have eye contact with the congregation. And I raised my eyes to have eye contact with the congregation and lo and behold, I lost worse contact. It was the worst few minutes of my life. There, was I, there were the people with bated breath and lifted brows staring at me and there was I looking for that elusive verse I couldn't find. I finally found it, squeaked it out, went back, sat on the pew and I said, Father, I'm not a public speaker. You know that, I know that. So let's not make a public fool of me. Don't do it again to me. And yes, the Lord left me like that on the shelf until I gave my heart to the Lord. And then I realized it is not me, it's Christ in me. I'm only the microphone. Uh, if you ask a microphone, are you nervous? The microphone, if it had life, you'd say, why should I be nervous? I don't speak. I only amplify the message of the speaker. Today, I'm a microphone for Jesus. I amplify. I just amplify his love to people around the world. And so my husband, after he completed his tenure as army chief, was sent to Pakistan. And we were there for a while. His, the, the president then was, had been his colleague. And so there was in, in the military academy and there was a close friendship. And while we were in, in Pakistan, the church we worship, worshipped in was attacked by a, um, uh, by a suicide bomber. And there, five of us died, 43 of us were injured. I myself went through two surgeries and I walked again on crutches. But that day, we went down to the basement to look for our daughter who had been volunteering to help the Sunday school because the teachers had gone back after 9-11. And there we saw debris and chaos and confusion, no children, no daughter, and we thought it was a fate worse than death. They had kidnapped her. Later, people found her on the other side of the road and they brought her back, and this was her story. She said, Mom, when, when, when I heard the bombs exploding, I said, God, have you taken my whole family? Am I left alone? Take me too, Lord. But first let me look after the kids in my charge. He, she couldn't open the doors in the basement. They were all locked. But then she saw a man in flowing white robes and she, he opened the door and helped her take the children out across the road. And when she looked back to thank him, he had vanished. We never saw him before or after. We call him our angel in Afghan robes. Our God still protects us with his holy angels. And yes, the president later 
he used to often invite us to his home because we were friends and one day the Lord said take the 91st Psalm to him and we took the 91st Psalm and we said to him uh, this is something you need more than we do and so we gave it to him it was our own Psalm you can't go in Pakistan getting uh, Christian uh, bookshops there so we gave him what we had and he read the 91st Psalm in, in the president's house the president of Pakistan read the 91st Psalm loud and clear while his eyes, wife's eyes filled with tears and she asked us where did you get these beautiful words from and we said it is from the holy bible and he said may i keep it we said yes it's for you and he kept it on his bedside table a couple of years later when we went back to Sri Lanka some Pakistani Christian delegates came to Sri Lanka and they told us they had had an audience with the president and when they went to the audience hall they said guess what we saw taking center place in the audience hall yeah, on the wall and we asked them what was it and they said, the 91st Psalm. We don't know how the president got it. We knew and we gave glory to God. You see, God has called us to influence all those whom we come in contact with. We are light and salt in this world. We reflect the love and the light of Christ. We are his hands, his feet, his heart of love. Our own president visited Pakistan when we were there and she cancelled all her programs. And she said, I want... The my ambassador to drive with me and I want to drive up into the mountains we thought she wanted to discuss some uh, important issues with, the, with her ambassador but when he got into the vehicle with her do you know what she asked him she said Srilal is Dilhani a born again Christian can you believe that the president of our country and my husband said yes ma'am my wife is a born again Christian and so am I and then she asked him the all-important question, what does it mean to be born again? And my husband had the privilege, the honor of witnessing to the president of our nation for 45 minutes with no disturbance or distraction, what it means to be born again, to invite Jesus as savior, as companion, as Lord of our lives, into our lives, to confess our sins so that all things pass away and all things become new and build up a relationship with Jesus who will never leave us nor forsake us. She heard it all and she went back to our country. A few months later, one of the cabinet ministers had a problem and he came to her uh, and, he's, and the president said to her, you know, I think you ought to telephone the former army commander's wife, the ambassador's wife in Pakistan and ask her to pray because her God will answer your need. Our president was now witnessing for the Lord. Amen. What about you? Someone out there is waiting for you. Someone groping in the dark. Someone whose heart is breaking. Someone who doesn't know what their future is going to be. Someone who thinks that life ends with death. They don't know about eternal life or abundant life on earth. You are the hands, the feet, the heart of the master. You are Christ's ambassador in Singapore. You are Christ's ambassador in your community, in your nation, in your city, in your world. Go into all the world, preach, teach, baptize and disciple in his name. My husband, he has said, as Joshua, General Joshua of the Bible said, General Sri Lal has also said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Even while I speak right now, our older daughter is, uh, is testifying in a university in, in uh, Pennsylvania, in USA. Our younger daughter is teaching in a newcomer's class in our church in Colombo, Sri Lanka. And we, their parents, are serving you here in Singapore. Go into all the world. Go and tell them the world needs Jesus as never before. And you, you are the ones God has chosen. What a privilege. Go and tell. And may the Lord bless you Trinitarians. May the Lord give you his abundant blessing, his anointing to go and to be a blessing as God has blessed you. God bless you. We hope you have been blessed by the message. For more information on our other sermon series or our events and seminars, do visit our website at www.trinity.net. On behalf of everyone here at Trinity Christian Centre, may God's presence, peace and power be so real to you today and every day. God bless.